Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and I can't wait to go over a fantastic lecture by Alan Watts, one of my very favorite teachers of spiritual knowledge, meditation, and reality creation. I completely recommend just looking up Alan Watts on YouTube. You will find so many wonderful lectures in his fantastic accent that resonate so clearly on so many levels. I've come upon some lectures that really fit within what we've been talking about on the podcast about God and reality creation. Neville Goddard talks about the idea that we are God. And there, it's kind of a basic idea. And I want to go deeper on the subject of what God is and how the universe works. Some of these questions are incredible. And the way that Alan Watts talks about it, proposing a dramatic model of reality, discussing the idea of hide and seek as a way of looking at God is wonderful. And it resonates with me. And I wanted to share it with you. And so I, I could have just given a, a recording of his lecture, but I wanted to read his words because it helps me enter the state of Alan Watt in many ways. But it also allows me to do a deeper dive and I can comment on some of the stuff that he talks about. I'll do my best to differentiate when I'm talking and when it's Alan's lecture, but I totally recommend reading any of his books. They are all fantastic. Every single one. He talks about so many different aspects and I wouldn't even know where to begin. So this lecture is called The Dramatic Model, and it talks about a dramatic model of reality. And it really resonated with me, and you will find some of the stuff he talks about here completely consistent with everything I've talked about from Reality Transurfing, Neville Goddard, The Law of Attraction, The Quantum Model of the Universe, but so much more questions, deep questions that we ask ourselves, Alan Watt tried to answer those questions. And so share with me and his words that resonate over the decades to this point right now, as you awaken to this new reality revolution. Alan Watt begins by saying the ceramic model of the world, the world as a political monarchical state in which we are all here on sufferance as subjects of God and in which we are created artifacts who do not exist in our own right, necessitates profound humility and the need to feel grateful. In this myth, only God exists in his own right. We exist as some kind of favor, and we really ought to feel grateful. It's like a stern father who says, look at everything I've done for you. All the money I've spent on decent clothes in college, and you turn out to be nothing but a hippie, you ungrateful, wretched child. And you're supposed to be sorry about that and apologize for who you are. We inherit this idea of a royal God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords from the political structures of Egypt and the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. Freud suggested that Aminatep the Four. The Pharaoh who abandoned polytheism is the original author of Moses' monotheism. Jewish law originates from Hammurabi in Babylon. These people lived in cultures where the pyramid and the ziggurat clearly indicated a hierarchy of power from the boss all the way down. In the ceramic model, God is the big boss who governs the universe from above. This is how we've inherited the idea that we govern our own body. We think that the ego found somewhere in the brain between the ears and eyes is the governor of our body. And so we can't understand a system of order, a system of life in which there isn't some kind of governor. But what if there were? What is this universe? Is it a monarchy, a republic, a mechanism, or an organism? If the universe is some kind of mechanism, 
it follows that it operates by itself. The fully automatic model, or that it's controlled by some great mechanic, the ceramic model. But if the or universe is an organism, it governs itself, since an organism is a thing that runs itself. In your body, there's no boss. You can argue that the brain is a gadget evolved by the stomach for the purposes of acquiring food. Or you can argue that the stomach is a device evolved by the brain to feed it, keep it alive. Whose game is it? The brain's or the stomach's? Actually, they're mutual. The brain implies the stomach. The stomach implies the brain. And neither one is boss. Have you heard the story about the fight between different parts of the body and the stomach? The hands, feet, and mouth all turned against the stomach. The hand said, I work to put food in the mouth. And the mouth said, I chew all this food to put in the stomach. And the feet said, I walk and walk to carry the hands to get the food it wants. And they all looked at the stomach as this lazy thing that just sat there. So they decided to teach the stomach a lesson. They went on strike. The hands didn't gather food, the mouth didn't chew, and the feet didn't take them anywhere. And pretty soon they found themselves getting weaker and weaker because they didn't recognize that it was the stomach's work to feed them. This is a fundamental concept of the universe and reality that I believe is, is lost, that Alan Watt is really pointing out. The interdependence of our system of reality we don't sometimes take this into effect. He goes on to say, there's another possibility. Maybe we're part of a system not delineated by the two prevailing myths. Maybe we're not living in a world where we exist as something separate from reality and therefore need to bow down to it and say, as a great favor, please preserve us in existence. And maybe we're not in a merely mechanical system in which we are nothing but flukes trapped in the electrical wiring of a nervous system that is fundamentally rather inefficiently arranged. So what's the alternative to the ceramic and fully automatic models? What's another image we can use? I propose the dramatic image. Consider the world as a drama. The basis of all drama of all stories and plots is the game of hide and seek. The first game you play with a baby is hide and seek. You put a buck in front of your face and peek around at the baby. And the baby starts giggling. The baby understands because it's close to the origins of life, it comes directly from the womb, knowing what everything is all about. It just can't put it into words. Every child psychologist tries to get kids to describe their feelings in psychological jargon. But the baby isn't there yet. It just knows. You put the book in front of the face, you disappear. You peek around, and the baby starts laughing. Because the baby is a recent incarnation of God. The baby knows that hide-and-seek is the basic game. As children, we were taught our one, two, threes and our ABCs but we weren't correctly taught the game of black and white. We learned about conflict, black versus white, instead of polarity. The difference is that poles are opposite, but they go together. For example, the poles of a magnet, north and south. What happens if you chop off the north end of a magnet? Well, the remaining magnet will still have the north and south poles. You can get rid of either pole, they may be poles apart, but they go together, and you can't have one without the other. In the same way, we haven't realized that black and white, life and death, good and evil, being and non-being all come from the same center. They imply each other. You can't have one without the other. Self and other go together in the same way as two poles of the same magnet. When people in our culture slip into a certain state of, of consciousness 
and proclaim that they are God, we call these people delusional or insane. It happens to people here and there. In the same way, people can catch the flu or measles. You can catch this way of thinking and believe you're God. And when you catch it, your interpretation of the experience all depends on your background. For example, if you think you're the God of popular Christianity, God as king, as the political head of the universe, you might expect omniscient powers and tell everyone to bow down and worship you. But if you live in a Hindu culture and suddenly tell your friends, hey, I'm God, they won't denounce you as insane as much as they'll congratulate you. Congrats, you finally found out. Because the Hindu idea of God is not autocratic. Shiva has ten arms. How do you use ten arms? It's hard enough to use two. Try playing the organ. You need both hands for the keys, both feet for the pedals. You have to play all these different rhythms. It's tricky. But actually, we're masters at this. How do you grow each hair? How do you beat your heart? How do you digest your food? And how... Do you do all this without thinking about it? In your very body, you are omnipotent in the truest sense of the word. You are able to do an infinite number of necessary tasks without giving them the slightest thought. So we talk a lot about on the podcast as we are God. But the big thing I wanted to point out from this is what was your concept of God before you heard that? Try not to carry that concept in because it's not what you think. As Neville Goddard says, God is your own wonderful human imagination. But you may be carrying this concept of God taught to you by your parents. That is not the concept of the human imagination in most cases. So break down what your concept of God is before you start to, un- to say or declare that you are God. Yes, you have great p- power. But what part of that is subconscious and conscious? As I said on a recent episode where I discussed Israel Rigardi's interpretation of Neville Goddard. He says that the subconscious is God. So it's very interesting, but actually we're masters at this. As Alan Watts says, he goes on to say, how do you grow each hair? How do you beat your heart? How do you digest your food? And how do you do all this without thinking about it? In your very body, you are omnipotent in the truest sense of the word. He goes on to say, when when I was a child, like most children, I regularly asked my mother all sorts of ridiculous questions. Eventually, she got bored with answering and would respond, darling, there are some things we're just not meant to know. And I'd ask, will we ever know? Of course, she said. When we die and go to heaven, God will explain everything to us. So I imagined that in heaven, particularly on wet afternoons, we'd all sit around the throne of grace and ask questions. Oh, Heavenly Father, why are leaves green? And he'd say, chlorophyll. And we'd say, oh. But in the Hindu universe, if you were to ask God why he made the mountains, he'd just say, well, I just did it. And he'd say that because there are no words to describe how the mountains were made. Words can't communicate how mountains are made any more than you can drink the ocean with a fork. A fork is useful for sticking into a piece of meat and eating it, but it won't do for imbibing the ocean. You could do it, but it would take millions of years, and you'd get thoroughly bored, just as you'd get bored of the description of mountain building, because the mountains weren't built with words. It just happened. Just like you can close and open your hand, how would you use the words to explain that? How would you describe how you're able to be conscious or beat your own heart? You probably can't put it into words, but you can certainly do it. So here's our game. We think the only things we truly know are those we can put into words. Let's suppose I fall head over heels for some young woman And my friend asks, but do you really love her? How would I prove that? If I'm articulate, say I'm a poet, I'd use the language of poetry to convince everyone of the depth of my feelings. Or maybe I'd craft the most beautiful love letters ever written. My friends read those and say, okay, I'm convinced you really do love her. 
But what if I'm not articulate? What if I can't describe my feelings very well? I'll have a much harder time convincing others. So when, I, when we teach the idea that we are God and we teach the idea of the laws of assumption, you get a lot of questions from people on how. How does this work? What do I do? Give me more specificity. And the point is there isn't specificity. And your focus on the hows and the words to describe this will fail you. It just happens. As Alan Watts says, our culture plays a very convincing game that nothing really happens unless it shows up in the newspaper. Our children have started to feel like they don't exist authentically unless they get their names in the papers. And the fastest way to do that is to commit a crime. Then you get photographed, appear in court, and everyone notices you. It only happens if it's recorded. If you shout and you don't hear an echo, it seems like the shout didn't happen. And that's a real hang-up we have. We like to hear echoes. Singing in the shower, where there's more resonance, for example, or playing a musical instrument that has built-in resonator, like a cello or violin. In the same way, when we're happy, the cortex of the human brain tells us we're happy. And that provides a certain resonance If you're happy and you don't know it, what's the use? But herein lies the problem. Several thousand years ago, human beings evolved a system of self-consciousness and we came to know what we know. At that point in our evolution, we stopped trusting our instincts. Instead, we had to think about everything and discipline ourselves according to foresight, words, symbols, calculations, and so on. And then we began to worry. Once you start thinking about things, you worry as to whether you thought enough. Did you really take all the details into consideration? Was every fact properly reviewed? And the more you think about it, the more you realize you really couldn't take everything into consideration because all the variables in any human decision are incalculable. So you become anxious. This is the price you pay for knowing that you know for being able to think about thinking and feel about feeling. So you're in this funny position. And this is an important realization that I had, that as Alan Watt has taught me, is words. Words can be a limitation for us. When I meditate, I start to attach a word to everything. The birds chirp and I think of the birds. And the the, the air condition turns on, I think air condition. And so breaking out of this mold of words, symbols, and language can be very powerful. This reflexive consciousness, Watt says, can be a great advantage. But this downside is terrible. We are aware of reality and have symbols that represent reality. We have wealth and money that represent a kind of wealth. But if you don't realize that the symbol is secondary, it doesn't have the same value. It's like when you we go to the supermarket gather a cartload of goodies and roll up to the cashier he says that'll be $75 please and we get depressed because we don't recognize that we just traded $75 worth of symbolic paper for an actual cartload of goodies we just think we lost $75 see the real wealth is in the cart but we're depressed because in our system the symbol has become more valuable than the reality Money represents power and potentiality, whereas wealth, well, we just think that the food is something that's ordinary and necessary because we have to eat. And that's really mixed up. But if you awaken from the illusion and understand that black implies white, self implies other, life implies death, or rather death implies life, you can begin to feel yourself. You can feel that you're not just a stranger in the world, that you're not something here on probation, that you're not fundamentally some sort of fluke, and you can begin to feel your own existence as absolutely fundamental. What you're basically deep, deep down and far, far in is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. So this concept that 
he discusses is important because a lot of people want, want to manifest or create wealth and they look at the dollar figures. And as they teach in many different systems, it's not the money. It's the experience and the feeling and the things that we get from the money that's important. And a lot of these feelings that we have about our wealth and our reality come from deep, deep models that, are go, that go deep into our subconscious. As Watts says, Hindu mythology refers to the world as the drama of God. To Hindus, God is not an old man with a white beard who sits on a throne with royal prerogatives. God is the self. Ch- Satichananda, Sat means that which is. Chit means consciousness and Ananda means bliss. The ultimate unchanging reality is gorgeous, full, and joyful. Just look at the night sky. All those stars are like a fireworks display on the 4th of July. Just like that, the universe is a celebration. Let's suppose that you were able to dream any dream you wanted to dream, and that you had the power in one night to dream over 100 years of your life or whatever length of time you wished. Naturally, as you began this adventure of dreams, you'd fulfill all your wishes. You could enjoy every kind of pleasure imaginable. After a hundred years of this type of total pleasure, you might think, whoa, that was pretty great. But how about now? I have a surprise. Let's have a dream that's not under my total control. And so you would. And you would enjoy whatever close shave your mind created for you. And you get more and more adventurous and gamble more and more. And finally, you dream the very life you're having right now. Within your infinite multiplicity of choices, you dream you were this particular life. You dream that you weren't God. And so when he explains this, this explains why, as Neville Goddard explains, why we escape and why we chose to enter this human instrument and forget. As Watt says, according to this idea, that's the whole nature of God, to play that he's not God. God abandons himself. He gives himself away and gets lost. In this way, everybody is the fundamental reality. Not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self. Deep down, you're all this basic reality, but you're pretending that you're not. And it's perfectly okay to play this game, to pretend that you're not God. Because that's the whole notion of drama. You go to the theater and assume your seats to see a comedy tragedy, thriller, or what have you. And you all know that whatever you see on the stage is not for real. But the actors conspire against you. They're going to try to persuade you what is happening on the stage is for real. They want everything sitting on the edge, everyone sitting on the edge of their seats. They want you terrified or crying or laughing, absolutely captivated by the drama. And if a skillful human actor can take an in an audience and make people cry, just think what a cosmic actor could do. She could take herself in completely and play with so much reality that she would start to really believe in the game. You're sitting there really thinking you're there. You've persuaded yourself so well. You've acted so well that you just know that this is the real world. But you're merely playing because the audience and the actor are one. You know that the word person means mask. The persona was the mask worn by actors in Greek and Roman drama. The the mask had a megaphone type mouth to throw the sound out into an open air theater. Per means through. And sona means 
what the sound comes through. That's the mask. How to be a real person, how to be a genuine fake, a mask. The dramatis personae at the beginning of a play is the list of masks that the actors wear. In the course of forgetting that this life is a drama, the word for the role, the word for the mask, has come to mean you are genuinely that is the person. I'm not trying to sell you on this idea in the sense of converting you to it. I just want you to play with it. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just putting it forward as a possibility of life to think about. One of the coolest concepts that I love that we've talked about on this podcast is reality transurfing. When Tufti the Priestess talks about we have several different scripts that we can choose from. Once we enter, in a, we can enter into new scripts. And that is what I believe is happening with reality, that we enter a script very much like a drama. Once we become aware of this, everything becomes even more fun. So instead of thinking you're a victim, Watt says, of a mechanical world or an autocratic God, try this on. The life you're living is what you have to put yourself into. Only you won't admit it because you want to play the game that it has happened to you. But instead of blaming your father for getting horny for your mother and expecting both of them to take responsibility for your crummy life since they brought you into the world, try considering that you were the shiny gleam in your father's eye when he approached your mother. And it was your intention that led you to become deliberately involved in this particular existence. And even if you've had a terrible life, rife with syphilis and tuberculosis and the Siberian itch, it has all nevertheless been a game. And isn't that an optimal hypothesis? Look, if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet, or that life is a frightful, serious risk, it will be an invariable drag. There's no point in going on living unless you make the assumption that the situation of life is optimal, that really and truly, we're all in a state of total bliss and delight. But we're all pretending otherwise, just for kicks. You play non-bliss in order to really experience bliss idea that you hear talked about in all levels of reality creation like Abraham talks about contrast and it's true when we go f- through the downs we experience the ups as Watt says you can really go as far out into the non-bliss game as you want because when you wake up from the game it'll be great you can't know black unless you know white and you can't know white without knowing black This is simply fundamental. As we discussed on episodes about the law of one, the whole universe is this duality between service to self and service to others. There's uh, there's dualities in everything that we experience. Mother, the father, the sun, the moon, good and evil. It's really an incredible thing. One of the things that Alan Watt really brought about is understanding these dualities and how they affect your reality. He continues to say, that's the drama. So to be frank and sum up my metaphysics, there's the central self. You can call it God or whatever you like. And it's all of us. And it's playing all the parts of every single being throughout the universe. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets involved in far out adventures. It gets lost. But in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you're ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready to wake up yet, you'll keep pretending 
that you're just some poor little me. But since you're listening to this and engaging in some sort of inquiry, I assume that you're in the process of waking up. Or maybe you're just teasing yourself with some kind of flirtation. With waking up what you're not serious about. Or maybe you're not serious, but you're sincere. You are ready to wake up. And if that's the case, if you really are on the path of waking up, of finding out who you truly are, then you'll meet a character called the Guru. To the Hindus, the Guru is the teacher, the awakener. It's the Guru's job to look you in the eye and say, Oh, come off it. I know who you really are. So whatever you bring to the Guru, your problems, your desire to get one up on the universe, your search for enlightenment, your pining for spiritual wisdom, or what have you. The Guru just looks at you and asks, Who are you? People used to approach the famous guru, Sri Ramana Maharshi, and ask him who they were in their previous incarnations, as if that mattered. And he would look at them and ask, who is asking the question? He'd just say something like, you're looking at me, you're looking out, but you're unaware of what's behind your own eyes. Go back in and find out who you are. I have a gorgeous photograph of him in my house, Watt says, and every time I walk past it, I look into his eyes and see the humor in them. I hear his lilting laugh that says, Oh, come off it. I recognize you, Shiva. What funny clothes you are wearing today. Gurus are tricksters, of course. Gurus play all sorts of tricks. And tricks are meant to put you through the mill because you won't wake up until you feel you've paid a price for it. Your deep sense of guilt or anxiety is simply a way of keeping the game going, of continuing to wear your mask, your disguise. Christianity is really good at making you feel guilty for existing. And you buy into this notion that your very existence is an affront, that you are a fallen human being. When I was a child during services on Good Friday, they would give each one of us a colored postcard with a crucified Jesus on it. And beneath him were the words, This have I done for thee. What doest thou for me? And we felt awful like we ourselves had nailed Jesus to that cross. And we felt guilty for even daring to exist at all. But that guilt is a veil across the sanctuary. It's a barrier with a warning sign that says, don't you dare come in when you're going to be initiated on one path or another before learning the great mystery, there's always someone wiser or more official than you saying, nope, not yet. You have to fulfill this requirement, then that requirement, and then another, and then we'll let you in. That's a way of putting you through the mill because you won't wake up unless you feel you deserve it. And you won't feel that unless the path is difficult. So you put yourself through one test and another and another until the journey has been sufficiently arduous. And only then will you admit to yourself who you really are. That's rather funny when you think about it. Neville Goddard corroborates this idea in his lecture on the state of John the Baptist when we go through this period where we, we try to be, make everything so hard on ourselves 
by limiting what we eat. And, and it's a state that we go through, and it's something I see all the time, people that are on the spiritual path, and they believe they have to flog themselves to reach a point of enlightenment. I've heard people say, it's just way too difficult to ever reach enlightenment or any knowledge of spirituality. And that's this perspective, this idea that you have to jump through hoops and meditate for 10 hours a day. As Watt explains in Zen, they say that when you attain Satori or enlightenment, the only thing left to do is have a good laugh. I agree with this. As Frederick Dotson explained in my interview with him, how do you really know and test a guru? And the first thing he said is, do they laugh? As Watt says, but Zen masters, every kind of master, for that matter, put up the barrier and run you through the mill because they're simply playing your own game. Another Zen saying has it, that whoever wants to study Zen should be beaten with a stick because he or she was stupid enough to pretend they had a problem in the first place. But you don't have a problem. You are the problem. You put yourself in this situation. Here's a fundamental question to explore. Do you see yourself as a victim of the world? Or do you see yourself as the world? If you define yourself merely as the voluntary network of your nervous system, then you've defined yourself as a victim in the game. And so you feel that life is some kind of trap imposed on you by God or fate or the cosmic mechanism and you can live out your life as some poor little me. On the other hand, you could also include in your definition of yourself that which you do involuntarily. You define yourself as the whole works. You beat your own heart. You grow your own hair. And no one imposes this upon you. You're not a victim. You are are doing it. You might not be able to explain how you do it because it would take too long and words are boring and clumsy. Regardless, you can claim your life and proclaim with gusto, I'm responsible. Whether comedy or tragedy, you did it. This seems a better basis for going on It's fundamentally more joyous and profitable and interesting and it's a lot better than defining ourselves as miserable victims, sinners, or what have you. I just love that lesson that Alan Watt gives here. And at the ending, it's so important. One of the first lessons, if somebody comes to me and for myself, on my own path, the biggest lesson that I had to learn in order to to change my circumstances, to accept reality, to overcome the deep spiritual muck that I had found myself in was to take responsibility for everything. You might not be responsible for everything, but take responsibility for it. There's something that happens. And I mean everything. There's something that happens when you do that. It gives you a power. So whatever it is, don't blame your parents Don't blame your friends. Whatever circumstance that you're in, blame yourself. Because only then you can change it. And you can open yourself up to the world that you're in. And you can wake up to your true power and the experience that you have. You've gone through all these contrasts in order to experience this universe. I honestly believe that you chose to come into this path you chose to forget you're playing a game of hide and seek but now you can claim your true power personally I found this very consistent with all of the other lectures there is no spiritual teacher or guru that is perfect or knows everything everyone offers 
knowledge that we can use. And, and it's up to you to take what you want from it so that it applies personally to your life. I tend to find consistency instead of contradiction. I'm sure that you might find contradiction in some of these from other lessons that I've give, given, but I see a lot of consistency in it. And I love his use of words. He's almost Shakespearean in the way he explains reality. I'll definitely be doing future episodes. Please let me know if you want more episodes with Alan Watt breakdowns, because there's many more that we can do that are very, very helpful in to understand the spiritual journey that you're going on, but particularly if, you, if it's awakening or reality creation or anything, Alan Watt was just an incredible thinker and he brought a lot to the table that really helps you to understand and answers deep questions that we start to ask ourselves at a very early age. I hope this resonated with you. And if it did, please put a like on this video and subscribe. Perhaps this might help someone out there on some level and by doing so you can help them all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com for coaching you can go to advancedsuccessinstitute.com thank you so much for sharing this journey with me I love you all and welcome to the reality revolution